right. All right, so why are we all here for RUN 101? Just to give you a quick recap of what RUN 101 is and what we're doing tonight. Um, the purpose of RUN 101, oh, before we get there, um, if you are just joining us for the first time and you may not know anything about Catalyst Miami, who it is Catalyst Miami? Well, Catalyst Miami is a nonprofit that works with communities to address immediate needs and to build a better future together. And so that's the basic pitch of who we are. Um, and we do that through various different ways, through a both and approach by reforming current systems and also ushering in a new people powered system. And so we do that through direct services. Um, we also do that through leadership trainings and programs just like this one to then go into our communities and have elected officials who are advocating and po proposing policies that will impact our communities for the better. And so now, why are we all here? Run 101 is a two session um, program that is open to anyone in the community that is wanting to help folks get understanding and understanding around and starting to think around what it is that you wanna do. Um, would you wanna run for office? Is it possible for you to run for office? What is that experience like? And so it gets you thinking about what it would take to run for an elected office um, and that also then leads into our Catalyst Candidate Institute, which is a five-week series starting on September 13th that provides more in-depth training. It's geared toward people who are really serious about taking a run for office in the near future. It requires an application process and you'll get mentorship and all of that great stuff. But both of these, both of these programs, including tonight's discussion, is a nonpartisan grassroots training program for for prospective candidates, campaign staffers, and it's all rooted in progressive values. And so um, the purpose of CCI um, that we'll start, that this program leads into to give you a little bit more information about that. Um, it's the intention is for it to be more interactive, more specific and hands-on to help individuals that are interested in running for office launch successful campaigns. And Catalyst still provides the nonpartisan support but each individual will also be paired with an elected mentor who can help them through the initial stages of their campaign and tailored support. So these sessions will include a lot more time and information around what we've discussed in these current, in these two sessions, but also more in depth with activities, assignments, and support to put into action what you've learned into your campaigns. And some of these sessions include campaign messaging, fundraising, developing your campaign team, et cetera. But upon completion of this session, we invite any and all interested participants to apply for CCI if you really do want to run for office. And we hope that these two sessions will be able to provide you with some foundational understanding and encouragement. And we look forward to CCI being a place to help you launch a successful campaign. But that's a little bit about the purpose of RUN 101. What is CCI and the Catalyst Candidate Institute um, and how these two things are interconnected. And so, so the next slide, we're going to get a little bit into group agreements. Just before we begin, we just want to make sure we're reestablishing group agreements so that way we can be present in this space. We have some wonderful guests with us tonight, a distinguished panel. And so we want to make sure that we're able to honor their time, honor their experiences, but also show up for one another within this space and invite them into this space as well with us. So whether you are a panelist, whether you are a moderator, or whether you are someone who's been with us for both sessions, what are some of the things that you need to feel safe in this space to show up, to share your experiences um, that we can agree to together? If there's anything that's not listed here that you wanna bring up once again, we'll take a minute to do that. Um, Feel free to just come off mute or drop it in the chat. What is it that you need that we can agree to together to build community and be present in this space together? What do you need to feel safe and heard? I'll come off mute to just say it's a nonpartisan perspective in the space. That's one group agreement. So. Is there anything else that's not listed here that we wanna make sure to capture using I statements, being present, building community together, stepping up, stepping back in our, in our uh, breakout rooms later on this afternoon. Is there anything else we wanna make sure to include? I would also say something that I would love to include 
we are here on these little boxes together. And when we don't see each other's faces, when we don't see each other, it's really hard to build that connection. And so if you are willing and able, please come on camera. We do not judge camera behavior. So if you need to cook in the background, if you need to walk your dog, whatever it is that you need to do, that is okay. We are not judging your camera behavior. We just are excited that you're joining us in presence together tonight. So if you can and are willing and able, please, please come on camera so that way we can engage with one another. And I see here we have don't judge, be curious, open mind, listen, and respect. Those are great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so I would say uh, it's for me personally to find my political voice uh, so that I can get a better, um, an, well, better angle as to who and what I represent um just as a prospective candidate for a political party love it love it love it all right well if there's anything else that we want to um, add to this list later on um feel free to um you know we can just drop that in the chat if you think of something else that comes up um, feel free to do that. But without further ado, we will move forward into our amazing and distinguished panel. Um, yep, we said be respectful even if you don't agree. So we can we can we can definitely hold on to that. Um, but again, so tonight's um, panel, we have some amazing, amazing guests. Um, and so we want to welcome them. Um, and for our moderator tonight, we have Andrew, Andrew Otasso. Is, and Andrew is the author of the Miami Creation Myth and the CEO of ARO Communications and a public, a public relations firm. He is consulted, he has consulted on congressional, state, and citywide elections. Andrew has employed, Andrew was employed as the Cuba Studies Group Executive Director before working at several public relations agencies. Andrew was a case writer at the Harvard Business School, implemented foreign policy at the state development, and was a Mexican president, Felipe Calderon's assistant. Andrew removed 23,135 pounds of trash from Miami's coast, which is a lot of trash. Um, speaking of climate justice, he was named to he was named to Brickles Miami Brickles Magazine top 20 under 40 list, local 10's most treasured citizen, Miami's next leader, FAES Latino leader, and received two proclamations from the village of Key Biscayne. So welcome, welcome, Andrew. We are so excited to have you moderate this panel and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Destiny. I have been a fan of Catalyst and Run 101 for many, many years. So I am so excited to be here today and with such a distinguished panel. So it is an absolute honor to moderate a panel of such accomplished civil servants. I really look forward to learning from their insights and experiences, as I know the audience is as well. And so without much further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's panelists. And we will start with Florida State Representative Ashley Gant, who was born on April 14, 1985 in Miami-Dade County. In 2007, she graduated from the University of Florida with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and became a Teach for America Mississippi Delta Corps member. Ashley returned home to teach in Miami-Dade County Public Schools for seven years. In 2016, Ashley graduated from NSU Shepherd Broad College of Law. While in law school, Ms. Gant served as chapter secretary and president of the Black Law Students Association. She is a member of Alpha Kappa, Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Ashley Gant Esquire is the founder and managing partner of Gant Legacy Law PA. In 2022, she ran and won the Democratic primary for Florida House District 109. So welcome, Representative Gant. Thank you. Okay, and next we have former County Commissioner Jean Monestim, first elected to District 2 in November 2010 and retired after 12 years due to term limits. After 30 years as a resident, resident of Miami-Dade County, he became the first Haitian American to ever serve on the Miami-Dade Board of County Commissioners. He is president of Gemo Enterprises, a full-service real estate and insurance company located in North Miami. 
a former councilman and vice mayor for the city of North Miami. Monestim served on several boards, including the North Miami Mayor's Economic Task Force, the North Miami Community Redevelopment Agency, the Miami-Dade Expressway Authority, and the Minimum Housing Appeal Board of Miami-Dade County. Monestim is also a former public school educator and adjunct professor of management at the University of Phoenix. The commissioner obtained his MBA from the Heizinga School of Business and Entrepreneurship at Nova Southeastern University. He also holds a bachelor's degree in finance from FIU. He's a graduate of the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. In 2014, he became the first ever chairman of the Miami-Dade Board of County Commissioners, elected by unanimous vote. He's married to Ketia, and they have two adult sons. Welcome, Commissioner Monestim. Thank you, Andrew. And next up, we have Council Member Sandra Harris, who is a retired public administrator and former director of the City of Miami Office of Transportation Management. She served a two-year term, two term as the second Black woman mayor of Miami Shores. She now serves as a council member for the Village of Miami Shores. Welcome, Council Member Harris. Thank you. My pleasure. Last but not least, we have Cassandra Timothy. Timothy, who was born and raised in North Miami. I apologize for my Cuban accent. In 2012, she graduated from the University of South Florida with a degree in political science and a master's of public administration degree from Florida International University in May 2022. Cassandra began her legislative career while working for Florida State Representative Janet Cruz and Florida State Senator Arthenia L. Joyner. As a legislative aide for Councilwoman Lisa Monteleone in the city of Tampa, Cassandra realized the power of local government, but she knew this job would be more meaningful if she were home. In May 2015, Cassandra joined the city of North Miami as its public information officer. In 2021, Cassandra became the first black person, the first woman of Haitian descent, and the youngest person elected to serve in North Miami City Council. Cassandra will serve a four-year term as councilwoman for North Miami District 2, which includes Palomar, Keystone, San Susi, Iron Manors, and downtown North Miami. Welcome, Council Member Timothy. Thank you. Okay, and with that introduction, the way this panel will work is that I will ask one question at a time, which the panelists will answer in sequence. This will go on for about 40 minutes or so, at the end of which I will switch to questions that the audience has submitted, and then I'll open it up to participants to ask their questions directly. And I am a stickler for time, which I know is rather rare in this city, so I'll do my best to stick to this timetable. And so we will start with Representative Ghent. And you, the first question for you is, it's actually a three-part question. Um, so broadly speaking, we would like to know what led you to decide to run for office. Specifically, how did you decide which office to run for? How did you determine the time was right? And were you ever, quote unquote, asked to run? Okay, so I'll start with the last question first. So thank you, first Catalyst Miami for inviting me on today. And thank you to everyone who's on this call for giving your time tonight to spend with us. So the last question is, yes, I was asked and I delivered a prompt no. I was like, no, I'm good. Thank you. I'm okay. Um, and that was when I first became an attorney and um, I was a public defender. And one of my former judges, my first judge was a former state representative. And then um, when I got promoted to felony, the another judge who was in felony was a former state representative and asked me to run. And I was like, no, or have you all been talking and coordinating? And that was um, probably like eight years ago at this point. Um, and so what made me run? I think I have a very unconventional path to office. I got angry, to be very honest. I was livid when, uh, and this is the answer to both the first and second question. I was livid when my former opponent made the 15-week abortion ban bipartisan by being the only Democrat to vote for it. 
And so after I verified that he was in fact, and indeed my representative, I had a very serious conversation with myself about, well, am I just going to complain on social media or am I going to do something? And so I did no research. I made a couple phone calls. I like to blame the fact that I ran on uh, Senator Dwight Bullard because he, well, after the two judges, he um, put a little bug in my ear in 2020 or 2021. It was like, you should totally think about it. I said, you can... I will, that seed will be planted in the ground and die. It's never going to uh, become fruitful, right? And so I called him and I was like, oh my gosh, did you see this? He was like, yep. And I was like, I'm going to run against him. And it was very (laughs) impulsive, to be quite honest. And if I would have done a lot more research, you know, I can't say that I would have ran. So I'm glad it did happen the way that it did. And uh, I... So the second part of the question, how did I know the time was right? There, that wasn't a consideration for me because I was, I asked myself, if not me, then who? And at that point, it was six months before the election and nobody had registered or um, filed to run against him. So it wasn't a matter of time. It was just a matter of like, if not me, then it will literally be no one. Cause in 2020, he ran unopposed. So that is how I came to be here with you all as state representative. That is amazing. Um, I know this is a nonpartisan panel, so I'll keep my opinions to myself, but that is, I did follow that race and taking on an incumbent and beating that person was very, very impressive. So amazing. Thank you. Uh, So next, same question, only to Commissioner Monestine. Um, so just to reiterate, um, how did you decide which office to run for? How did you determine the time was right? And were you ever asked to run? Once again, uh, thank you, Andrew, for agreeing to moderate this uh, distinguished panel. And, and thanks as well to the many um, um, attendees, if I can uh, call you that. and. Also, my hats off to Destiny and my good friend, Rachel. Uh, I think Rachel is responsible for getting me here. And um, thank you. Uh, this, is, this is very good. Uh, well, uh, I was uh, as well massively recruited both uh, to run for city council and also for county commissioner. I, I was someone who believed that I would never run for office. <laughs> Uh, you know, as my resume uh, uh, told you, I, uh, I, I, I'm a business major. I had a successful small real estate enterprise, uh, an insurance enterprise, and uh, and I was a good, a good financial contributor at the time to uh, candidates running for office, and and uh, but most importantly, I was um, I was on Haitian radio doing uh, business education uh, and I was young and, and I thought uh, I, you know when when you're in your 20s and and you're done with 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 uh, college you think you know something and 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 uh, and I started speaking on the radio after I was invited uh, you know many time and and eventually I become uh, I think the, the the host of a business education uh, program and people liked it. And they, they, that's when they started recruiting me. It started, you know, I started uh, earning a name in the community and people started uh, reaching out to me, asking me to run for office, which at first I told them no. Second time I told them no. Uh, third time I decided, hey, maybe I should uh, reach out to my wife to see what she thinks. She said, well, I don't like it, but if you want to consider it, I'll support you. Uh, eventually uh, we... Uh, uh, I, I, I decided to run um, for a vacant seat, a vacant seat, and, 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 and I became a city councilman in North Miami. And later on, I was prematurely asked by others to run for mayor of the city, and I did and lost. And I was, I was, I couldn't be a happier, a happier loser because you know, being in office, you you think um, I'm, I'm, I'm losing money and. And I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not a politician. People are talking about you. And I decided that's not for me. 
and 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 I lost and I was happy actually it was my race to lose and I lost it and people some people that worked hard in my campaign I was embarrassed for them because they were crying in, in my loss and I was in my heart yay I, I'm going back to making some money and 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 um I did well after that and and uh, during the recession when business went bad especially the real estate market people started reaching out to me again uh, and, and asked me this time to uh, run against a sitting uh, county commissioner. And, and at first, again, I said no. I, I, I said no a second time. And my dad at the time, who was very old, 90-some years old, was still alive. He never wanted me to get involved into politics. And, and one day he was listening to Haitian radio and he said, I heard so many people talking about you. What, what do you think? You don't think you should run for office? And I said, how would you of all people ask me to run for office? And he said, well, I think it's time. And that was the last blessing is bestowed on me before he, he passed because uh, after hearing him, a couple of other leaders in the community and close friends and family members, I decided to run, which was kind of like, that race was kind of like a force of nature. And, and we unseated a, a sitting commissioner and, and uh, a year and a half after my, uh, my uh, induction into the uh, county commission, he passed away. So yeah, uh, I think being recruited is a good way uh, as the representative just uh, mentioned earlier to you to know that, for you to know that it's time uh, to, to make a move uh, you know, for elected office. That is an amazing story. And, you know, as a fellow, as, as a son of immigrants, um, like that just make, I'm sure your father was so proud um, when, you, when you won that race. That is incredible. Thank you so much. Um, so same question again for council member Harris. Uh, so how did you decide which office to run for? How did you determine the time was right? And were you ever asked to run? Sorry, I was muted. Thank you for having me. I'm a fan of Catalyst Miami and a graduate of one of your leadership programs. Uh, uh, why did I decide to run? Um, I'm a least likely politician. I'm a public administrator by trade. And that's almost like the opposite of being a politician. However, I like to engage in uh, the sports of talking about politics and criticizing politicians. Yes, I do. And you, know, you have all the answers when you don't have the problems and that would be me. So was I asked never by any, any you know, machine or any type of organization, but by my friends who know that I'm interested in politics and they thought it would be right for me. I said, never, no, I think we all said the same thing that that would just not be something that we would do. And uh, what happened, I went on a sabbatical I left my job. I went on a sabbatical in 2020, 2019, actually, and I was bored. So uh, in our small municipality, uh, it was time to run for office. And I said to my husband, I think I'm going to run for a council seat. He responded, just don't involve me. That's what he said. <laughs> so I got together my neighborhood friends. And this is a municipal uh, role. So it's small and more intimate than, you know, a state or a county uh, situation. So I got my little eight to 10 friends, housewives here in Miami Shores. And that became my campaign team. We were like the bad news bears. You know, we had no professional campaign managers or nothing like that. But we were just determined we were going to do this. And this is a small enough environment to sort of test it. And what did I have to lose? You know, I wasn't uh, passionate about anything. I wasn't motivated by anger about anything or dissatisfaction about anything. I love my community. I was motivated by needing something to do that I thought was manageable and loving and wanting to serve my community, just that. And so I decided to run that the time was right because I had times, first time in my life that I had time for service. Uh, I get paid $1, so it wasn't a financial decision. And, and whenever you run, it's never a financial decision. It's actually a vow to poverty, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that's my story. It's not a, a really exciting story, but just me and some girlfriends in the community. And I look at it just service to my community. I still don't view myself as a politician. 
uh, although we, you know, legislate and do things like that, I don't see myself as that. I see myself as a resident in my community, making the best decision I can for my community. What a fantastic result to arrive out of uh, boredom. Yeah. <laughs> you could have learned a new language. You could have taken up knitting. No, you ran for office and won. That's, that's awesome. Why not? <laughs> All right. And then, so, Council Member Timothy, also, same question. How did you decide which office to run for? How did you determine the time was right? And were you ever asked to run? All righty. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Cassandra Timothy from North Miami. Um, so the first, well, I guess I'll start with, was I asked to run? No, I was not. Um, I actually was born and raised in North Miami, lived here all my life. Um, in Tampa, I was kind of pressured to run. Hey, why don't you run for this person's seat and that person's seat? But Tampa was at home. Tampa, I didn't know the streets. Tampa, I didn't know the community. So I couldn't run in a place where I wasn't raised. So when the door opened up for me to come back to North Miami, because I was on the staffer side. So I worked in, I worked for politicians and I've never worked on their campaign. I wanted to put that out there. So I've worked for state representatives. I worked for a city councilman. I worked for a state senator. Um, I enjoyed being in Tallahassee and, you know, I just, I enjoyed being on the inside. And then um, I worked for North Miami for five years. So I essentially became the face of the city, the voice of the city. Um, and kind of like um, Councilman Harris um, from Miami Short, I too got bored but working in North Miami. I got bored, you know, writing the talking points for the politician. I got bored writing the newsletters for the politician because essentially they were my ideas, right? And I was just making it theirs. Um, so for me, I wasn't asked to run, but I was approached by the staffer from the councilwoman's office that I took her seat. And she asked, did you want to run for the seat? And I was just like, hmm. I, you know, had to think about it because I didn't realize her seat was open. So I did have aspirations to work, run for office one day, maybe when I was older, after I made enough money, because I understand that you do not get into this gig for money. Like it is truly community service. It is truly out of the goodness of your heart because you get dealt with a lot. Um, so when she approached me, I, I was like, I, you know, I said, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. Let me see if my family's behind me um, because I know I could not do this race without my family. Um, yes, North Miami is predominantly Haitian, but the seat that I was able to win has never been held by a Black woman, never been held by a Haitian woman. Um, it was Keystone. It was San Susi. It was the East Side. And so I just kind of, oh, hey, Carolina she's in there so Carolina's in the chat she was actually she worked for the councilman and she actually kind of she was I called her the farmer because she sowed the seed and told me hey would you want to do this and everyone thought I was crazy uh, I was the only chocolate drop in the race of seven um I ran against someone who was the former mayor of North Miami and everyone thought I was dead on arrival like she's not gonna do this she's not gonna win but I had faith I had my message and I knew why I was doing it and for me, after I got tired, I got fired up because it was in 2020, in May of 2020, I made the decision. So we're in the heat of COVID. I caught COVID in July of 2020, um, where everybody thought I had, you know, COVID was like the worst thing ever. And I just used that time to prepare. I used that time to get ready. Um, and I launched my campaign in September. Everyone told me that, hey, Cassandra, you were starting too early, but I started when I wanted to start. And I, I actually was beneficial because there was so many any, you know, absentee ballots. There were so many people voting, you know, registering to vote by mail. I was the first one out the gate. And I just said I was going to do this, me and my family collecting petitions, telling everyone my story and running my race how I saw fit. I determined it was right because it was an open seat. Um, I looked at the numbers. Um, I said, okay, well, I knew the community. Um, this was home. Like I worked here for five years. I quit my job and I said, hey, I'm going to invest $10,000 of my own money. I was saving up for a house. And I said, I'm going to invest this into my my race and I did it and I had mentors like Commissioner Jean Monestine who was a huge supporter who you know gave me great insight and said hey if you're doing this do it so um I think that's why I decided to run for office um it was my passion it is something that 
I, you know, you just get tired of being on the inside and you eventually want to make that transition. So for me, it was, it was just seeing where the world was in 2020. We were in COVID, we were stuck. We were seeing a president that just wasn't being a president, right? We were seeing um, just John Lewis, we were seeing him pass away. And there was just all of these things that just kept on happening. And while I was tired, I was also fired up. I was fired up for change. I was fired up and say, you know, if I don't do it now, when will I do it? And that's why my campaign slogan was the time is now because Cassandra, now was the time to run. And I did it with faith, I did it with family, and I did it with knocking on every single door with two pairs of running shoes that look like <laughs> dogs ate it afterwards. But that's my story, um, and, and now I'm here. Love it. Just goes to show that, you know, the haters can go take a long walk <laughs> off a short pier. If you are a smart candidate, if you are driven, you can absolutely win. So I love that. Um, Next question, I will just open it up to anyone in the panel who's interested on in taking it first. Um, but what's your best advice for running as a candidate outside the establishment? So for me, I, I, I guess I'll start this one off because um, when I decided to make the decision to run for office, everyone told me that I couldn't do it. Everyone said, hey, you're not going to raise enough money. How are you going to make anywhere between 50 to $100,000 to raise this raise? You know, thank God everybody got a, a refund check. Or what, what check did they get? The stimulus check and friends and family donated. My family and friends alone donated about $50,000 to my campaign. Um, and that was the Kickstarter that got me to the runoff. And then from there, the doors just kind of opened up. But I think if you have a message, if you believe in yourself, if you have friends and family that will work with you for free, because my family did, and just knock on those doors and they know your message and they know who you are. Um, and they're going to rally behind you. Like I had my sorority sisters, my church family. I reached out to everyone, ex-boyfriends. <laughs> everyone was on the campaign trail with me. And the establishment said, Cassandra, you were going to lose. Other elected officials were just like, oh, don't donate to her. They were calling people that donated to me and say, hey, you might want to donate to the former mayor because he's going to win. And so everyone was against me. But I think if you just believe in yourself, you believe in your message, you just knock on every single door and you leave nothing on the table. When the end of the race come, you better not have not a dollar left over. You better just give it your all because the moment you say, hey, I'm going to wait for this, it'll be that that one thing that you should have did that you didn't do. So for me, I went against the establishment. I went against everyone who told me that I couldn't do it. Um, and I just believed in myself. And I just kept telling myself, Cassandra, run your race. You're running it your way. Commissioner Monesting likes to say I ran cute. <laughs> Um, but it was just what I wanted to do and I did it my way and it worked. So I think once you believe in yourself and you have your message and you know your why, why you're doing something, um, the, start, the sky's the limit. That works. I'll go. I wanted to raise my hand, but I couldn't figure it out. Um, so some of my thoughts, uh, Councilwoman Timothy has said, and basically I would say you have to know your why and why are you doing this? Because you're really going to, I like to say that you're gonna strip yourself naked. People are going to come at you. You're not gonna have anything hidden, which in the end, that's gonna be good because people with nothing to hide, hides nothing. And so know your why and don't get distracted by the noise and run your own race. I heard a councilwoman say that, run your own race. I was not the establishment candidate. Now I was running in a smaller municipality that has a lot of mechanisms in place that you really don't need a lot of money. We have about three newsletters here. We have Facebook groups, all these things. I worked because I didn't raise money because money wasn't coming my way. Well, for two reasons, I made a, a, a vow not to collect more than a hundred dollars per person. And I didn't take any endorsements or any of the, you know, different type of things that the machine brings to you because I wanted to be a different politician. I just, and I'm still that way. I'm true to who I am. So I didn't have a lot of money. I ran a race with about $3,500, started with a loan for myself and uh, others raised 70,000, things like that. So uh, in the natural, there was just no way that I could win this. And I often got sort of discouraged and like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And I would just say, just take the next, next step, the next step. 
And when you don't have money, you have to go out there, you have to knock on doors, you have to engage people, you have to do the legwork when you you can't bring three or four flyers in, in the mail like, like my uh, other people were doing. I didn't have that kind of money, nor did I want that kind of money for a small municipal election. It's nonpartisan, it was small. So I just really did it the old fashioned way, you know, using social media and walking walking, 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 and it paid off. So know your why, stay focused, and know that it's going to be hard, but it's doable. You could achieve it. People will relate to you. And I remember when Dottie Joseph came to my house uh, when she was first running, and my husband was so impressed that this lady came to the door to speak to him. I, I didn't even speak to her. He did. And all of my friends, the whole neighborhood was abuzz about Dottie Joseph. I hadn't even met the lady yet, but I remembered that you need face time with these residents. You really do. <laughs> thank you. Commissioner Monestim, I saw your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, my humble advice would be the following. Uh, first, I think um, one of the speakers already mentioned part of it, to be the best definition of yourself, to know yourself well, uh, know yourself emotionally, know your shortcomings, know your sh yourself culturally, uh, know your strength, uh, know your weaknesses, um, and be unapologetically, uh, unapologetically uh, you, <laughs> okay? Uh, don't, don't waver when it comes to who you believe that you are. And, and, and um, another thing is, is, is that, uh, uh, you know, Money is important in politics, but it's not everything. Um, I, I'd share with anyone that when I ran in 2010 for county commissioner, um, uh, well, let me contrast this. I, I ran for mayor of North Miami and raised more than $100,000 in a city of 60,000 people uh, and, and lost. And for county commissioner in 2010, because there was uh, you know, a community uh, such strong community support. I I raised forty thousand dollars in the primary, <laughs> and and made it to the runoff in a pack of five, uh, and, and ran sixty plus thousand dollars for a general election, and and move up 20, 26 or twenty eight points <laughs> from where we were in the primary, uh, and the the incumbent only moved up like three or four points in the general election from from the primary to the general election. So so. Um, and, and one need to also know how to say no. Uh, I, I think that that's a that's a major test because when you run in uh, people, people who don't know uh, uh, how to run for office will tell you what to do, and you need to candidly be able to tell them, you know what, I, I won't be able to do that. Or oh, if you can help me in some other ways, I'm not going to do that. And and, and you, you need to also know how to manage expectation because not only when you are not in office, people would think that you can do everything. Even as a candidate, people want you to be everywhere, every time, I mean, all the time, and, 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 and you won't be able to do that. So another thing I'd say is um, if, if you have the opportunity to do so, don't wait for elected office to start serving because if you're serving your community every day, whether you uh, you you intent on running for office or not, uh, or whatever else come after that, uh, you know you you'd be comfortable doing because the community support, whether it's for your business, uh, whether you're a teacher, whether you, you you're an administrator, when you call on people, they 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 they'll answer. So these are my two senses. And now I'll wrap that question up. Uh, so I echo everything they said, uh, run your own race and ex especially know your why. But I'll also add on those days during the campaign when you're questioning, what the heck am I doing to myself? What the heck am I doing with my life right now? Just remember that when you put it all on the court, when it's all said and done and you give it everything, you've given it your all, no matter what the outcome is. And that's what I kept telling myself. I kept, I approached it like I approached the bar exam. 
at the end of the day, I will say I did everything. And however it works out, if I pass, I know, you know, I did it successfully. If I don't pass, that means that I need to get new skills to pass. And so that's how I approach this campaign. And, you know, the naysayers will be there. They were like, okay, you can get your name out because my former opponent was so entrenched in the community. Everybody thought I was going to lose. And I was just like, all right, I'm just do the work. So if you're that type of person that uses the negative energy to fuel yourself, to prove people wrong, that's, that's who I am. Okay. I am a trial lawyer. So I'm confrontational and I don't mind being confrontational. So I'm like, all right, let's go. But if that fuels you go, like go all the way in. But if you are the type of person and you have to know yourself where that can discourage you, you need to cut it off. Say, thank you. Very politely set boundaries. Thank you. I believe in my team. We have a plan. I would appreciate your support and keep it moving. Don't be afraid to cut conversations off because everybody is going to be a master campaign manager, okay? Everybody is going to have some type of advice. Just remember your why, have faith in your team. And when it's that last door and you are exhausted, just think that this your race can come down to one vote and this could be the vote that, that determines you as the winner. So knock on that door or knock on those five last five doors. And that's how I approach my race. Um, and I 100% will recommend, you know, making sure that you're true to you when you do it. And don't do this for clout or for the title or for any of that, because it's absolutely not worth it if that's your motivation, okay? Excellent advice, fantastic. Um, so this next question, it's a two-part question. And once again, I'll just leave it open to the panel. So whoever wants to answer it first can go ahead. Uh, first part is what is the most rewarding aspect of running for office and of being elected? And the second one is what is the most challenging part of running for office and being an elected official? Let me yes, start. For, the most challenging part, to be very honest, is not cussing people out, okay? Because they will try you to your face. And you have to get really creative with how you respond and set boundaries and set people straight. Um, that's the most challenging part for me right now. And I know this is a nonpartisan organization, but the dynamics and the numbers that's in Tallahassee. Uh, I am pretty, I'm pretty good at uh, navigating adversarial circumstances, being a trial lawyer, but it is very difficult when you know the legislation that's being passed is going to harm people. So just keeping yourself grounded in that regard and staying true to you. Don't compromise yourself because you have to wake up in the morning to look at you. Um, the rewarding part is getting answers and helping people. Like that's been a part of my service since I was in high school. Like all of my adult life, there's been a component of service, whether it was my actual job or organizations that I've been a part of. And so providing those answers to people. And I think that goes hand in hand with me being an attorney now because I'm a problem solver. So figuring it out. And now that I actually have the ability and the power to make a phone call and things happen. I do that without, you know, any regard for anything else, because that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be serving my community. So just making sure that I provide the help. And if I can't, if I can't, then I'm going to point them to someone who can and, um, you know, try to advocate, advocate for them. But it's, it's really that, that feeling you get when somebody is like in tears, thanking you because it's hard. Like life is lifing right now, especially in Miami. So being able to help people is the absolute best, um, part of this, this new position that I'm in. I'll, yes. I'll, Go um, ahead. What's most rewarding for me now, be mindful that I'm a small municipality. And so you're really close to the people, sometimes too close. That's the bad part and the good part. These residents are the same ones you're in the grocery store with, the dry cleaners. You see them everywhere. You really can't get away. But I enjoy knowing my community, 
uh, more intimate than I knew before, hearing their concerns. Uh, definitely, I ditto what uh, Representative Gantt said, solving their problems. I, I love that because we're all here, we're motivated by service. So serving the people at the end of the day, you feel good that you've done something well. And the worst part about it is maybe the loss of anonymity, especially in a small little community. And people are not always nice, but yet you have to be, you know, they expect you to be nice, but they're not always nice. Uh, I've even received a death threat and everything. So the people, it's always about the people, the good and the bad is always about the people. So that's my two cents. <laughs> I don't see the 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 icon where I raise my hand. May I? Neither did I. <laughs> absolutely, go for it. Absolutely. All right. Well, the the, the most uh, the most uh, rewarding part I'd say is the opportunity to serve and and to to know when and where you make an impact. Uh, if you know when and where you're making an impact, if you if you know how to navigate um, the halls of uh, of of government of power to to make sure that um, resources and opportunity uh, trickle down to your community um, that's that's extremely rewarding and and for some of us um, things happen faster quicker and 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 better uh, when 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 you know how to work with uh, people in administrative position instead of you know. Um, a bickering on the dais, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and 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 that's that's I find very rewarding. Um, I, I think that's 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 what I call a, a political diplomacy. Uh, whereas you, you know you spend a little bit more time. I mean, it's uh, it's you know you know building relationship with people that make decisions every day uh, as bureaucrats. Uh, uh, versus of, of fighting versus fighting for for uh, some few dollars in the budget. So so that's very rewarding. Uh, the most uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, challenging part is is um, uh, honestly is especially in running for office is to know that as you run you may lose, <laughs> but the, the 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 biggest challenge is you actually losing. But but I, I developed this notion that no one that actually run for office uh, actually loses because at the end of the day, you, you're able to qualify and quantify the people that support your vision. Mm -hmm. And if you have to do it next time, you know you can't. You have an, a needle to move. Uh, whether you were at thirty percent and you run the second time, you win, or you run the, the second time, you you gain a, 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 a forty five percent. But but you basically have a vision that other people partake in, and that's extremely positive. Another rewarding thing, I would say, when it comes to running for office or being in office, you definitely know who your haters are. You definitely know, uh, okay? You definitely know, uh, uh, you know, if you, some people call them enemies, but, but I don't really call all of them enemies. You know who your haters are because some of them are just jealous, some of them, may not understand what you're doing and how you and how you go about doing what you do. Uh, some of them uh, just disagree with you, matter of factly. So, um, and, and they're all in the group of, of haters if we cannot do so democratically and candidly and respectfully. So, so I think, um, uh, you know, but the most gratifying portion of it is being able, as Representative Gantz said earlier, uh, finding this, this uh, person who is uh, not as res as resourceful as as others, uh, as uh, you know, this this person or this family that is challenged, maybe financially uh, or, or, or uh, in some other ways that would come. And and as a politician, you are a human being as well. And this person come and and say thank you, commissioner. Thank you, representative. Uh, thank you, uh, a village member for or a city council member for what you've done for me. And sometime uh, you may not even know that you did that, but if you have good staff that basically emulate who you are as a public servant and, and, and render those services as you are expected, in my case, you'd be fired if you don't, <laughs> okay? Uh, and this would be rewarding to you when, when this feedback, when this, when this feedback comes to you. And, and, and that's extremely 
uh, uh, satisfying. And, and I'll add this in conclusion. And for those of us uh, who, who, who understand that there is no money in running for office, I think it's this emotional uh, uh, gratification. It's that sense of, of service um, that keeps you doing it uh, through the sacrifice that you have to put up with because you know it's for the uh, good of, 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 uh, of the community. It's for the greater good, I would say. And, and, that's, and there is no substitute to that. Yes. Um, and I would add, um, agree with everyone. Um, the most rewarding part of running for office for me um, was mostly seeing my family excited. Um, they were my power, like when I, I was, I was like the dream power ranger and they would charge me up. Um, so seeing my nephew say, auntie, I'm ready to go walking. Like he told me last week, auntie, I miss campaigning. And I was like, no, don't say that. <laughs> but it was my family. My family was my pulse because I was weak. I was deflated. I was, uh, I, I didn't have any more. I felt like Moses, hold my hand up because I couldn't anymore. Um, but the most rewarding part when I look at my election was my family and the, your core group because they become your energy. They become, you know, your right and your left. So for me, that was the most rewarding part of running for office. The most rewarding part of being elected, like everyone said, is rendering services to my community. Um, I was in the Public Service Academy at Turner Tech. I joined Delta Sigma Theta, so already committed to public service. So public service is just at the core of everything that I do. And so when you're able to give an elderly an AC unit because she was, you know, her 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 AC broke down. Um, I remember Carolina. We cried that week when this little little boy um, who was missing an arm um, came to one of our sports clinic that we had and the mom was just so excited that I was able to do summer initiatives in the summer and that's why I try to do something during the summer to keep the kids active um, just making sure that we could just render services whether it's to family this week we'll be building a mini pitch and a pickleball um, at one of our parks um, the library is getting a new playground so seeing people get excited about improvements coming into their community uh, my residents were happy about trees that I brought into their median. So those are the wins that you get while you're elected. Um, the challenges of running for office, I said all of it, right? You have to raise money. You can't trust everyone. Um, there's a loss of privacy. So, you know, if you thought you had a sense of privacy, it's gone. Um, it, all of the challenges that could come from running for office, Carolina will often tell me, stop telling people you're broke. And I'm like, well, this month, I don't know if we're going to raise enough to pay people. So it was literally just like, hold, just being on edge every month. Are you going to meet your fundraising goal? Are you going to get that supporter? But the challenges will be great and near, um, and everything will come against you that you thought couldn't come against you. Um, I think missing out on everything um, while I was running for office because I ran for so long, you miss out on birthdays, on weddings, like you, it's sometimes, it, for me, it was traumatizing at some point, and I even lost my memory. Um, I can't even tell you what happened during my campaign while I was running. So you have to prepare for it mentally, spiritually, emotionally, because it will take a physical toll on you. Um, now, after being elected, you still have to prepare because they don't tell you about the political 40 that you put on because <laughs> everyone wants to take you to lunch or whatever the case may be. Um, now you still have the haters. There's if now you have more haters because there's people who can't, you just can't trust people who are out here to set you up or to watch you fail. They want you to, oh, I want to catch you slipping because, you know, you're obviously corrupt because all politicians are corrupt. Um, but it's, it's, it's a lot in having to dispel those rumors, but just kind of remaining true to yourself. Um, but it is rewarding at times as well, too. Thank you for that. So our next question is what is something you know now that you wish you had known before you ran for office? And I'll just open it up to whoever wants to answer first. I'll start. Um, I wished I would have known how difficult the race would be, uh, how what, what big of a commitment it was. You know, when you decide you're going to run for something, you pretty much see yourself at the finish line or in the job. It's like trying to get a job. You see yourself there. But I think that I underestimated what campaigning is about. Like people ask me right now, would I run again? And I think about the campaigning part, the job, I say, yes, if I could get the job, mine is a campaign. 
but the campaigning takes a lot of grit. It's tough and it's just hard to do. And then once you get the job, you realize how challenging it is to get anything accomplished. You know, you have to have the votes and the support. You may have great ideas, but they, they just never see the light of day. You compromise more than you thought you were, especially on issues just to get something done and how different things look on the outside. On the outside, when you're running, you have all of these ideas of what you're going to change and what you're going to do. Now, in all honesty, I knew enough not to do a lot of that because as a department director, I, I worked with elected officials and th things like that. So I had an outside look that I now know that is different on the other side, definitely. But, you know, we make all these campaign promises. And things look different on the inside. So people say, oh, well, that's not what you said when you were running. I get things like that. But I'm now equipped with better information. So I think that part of growth is being able to move on your position once you're afforded different information. So that's what I would say. Yes, Commissioner Montesino. Well, uh, I wish I wish I knew how much power uh, as a politician, as an elected person, I wasn't going to have. I, 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 knew, I, I wish I knew the limit of my elected office power. Uh, before you elected, you know that you have that much power, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, only to realize uh, later on, uh, no, it has its own limitation. Yes. And I wish I also knew how much uh, power were in the hands of bureaucrats and other people behind the scene uh, controlling the levers of power. <laughs> okay. <Yep. laughs> uh, uh, people who are in, in, in extremely important posi administrative position who are indebted to some wealthy individuals, some power brokers, some, some others uh, who preceded them that uh, led them to that office and the, these are the, the, the things that you are blind, blindsided by and, and you only wish you know who to talk to to help make that decision, even if the, the person in, in the actual position uh, and, and that actual administrative office uh, wish to help you. So I wish I knew all these things. Um, um, uh, but but um, the other thing is, is uh, but I learned, I learned through, through all that uh, it's, it's not it's it's important that you try to that you are able to do certain things but it may be as important to to try to attempt at the greater at the greatest thing irrespective of of what others uh, may feel about your your vision your ideas uh, they may see they may they, they may not be as uh, you know especially when others realize that you know that's short-sighted that you have greater visions that they always in opposition to that it's it's as important as you you are bringing these forth attempting to accomplish these great things on behalf of your community because at times it's not enough that you alone accomplish these great great things you may be the one seeding for the person after you for that for that uh, young individual that that's you grooming for that uh, other person that is that may be unknown uh, in your community that may be replacing you, uh, uh, you know, that, that may uh, be holding office after you. So it's important that you attempt to do great things and greatest thing on behalf of, of your office. And I'll quote with this, I, 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 at my age, I didn't think um, before uh, Barack Obama got elected president that I was gonna be a black, black president in office, but, but I'm reminded that, you know, during uh, his, um, his campaign, uh, his uh, campaign victory speech, and on, and also during his inaugural uh, speech, that he credited uh, uh, the 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 sacrifice of Dr. King for uh, paving the way uh, uh, to for him to be elected 40 years later, <laughs> more than 40 years later as, as president of the United States. Uh, so so uh, you know, sometime you have to seed. So and and others may be able to reap, to 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 harvest or to reap. But but at the end of the day, sometime uh, you never know your your vision. Uh, you may be able to see the free, uh, fruition of your vision as well because others are watching and listen and, and listening. Um, 
I think something I wish that I would that I I knew earlier is that you lose a lot after you get um, elected. You may lose friends, you may lose family members. It's very lonely at times. You have to isolate yourself. Sometimes when I to help manage my stress, I'll I'll go away for a couple of days just to kind of cool off. Um, Commissioner Monestine once told me, I don't know if you remember this, he said that you don't have per permanent friends, you don't have permanent enemies, you have permanent interests. And there's always someone looking for something, um, whether they want to vote, they want access, maybe they want to control the way you think. Like You'll be surprised the, the, the extremes that people will go through or go to um, to get to you. Um, and it's just, you just kind of have to re remember your why, remember, you know, have something to hold on to. For me, what keeps me grounded in this season is my faith. My faith has been tested, but my faith has also grown. Um, and it's like a diamond. It's not shaking. It's not moving um, because I know where I'm rooted and grounded. Um, so I think for me, that well, that's what keeps me, you know, that's what gives me peace at night, knowing that I am making every decision with, and every um, every decision, every vote, every anything that I do, I do it for the community. I know who I'm answering to. And that's that, that, that for me, for me, that's God. So for me, that's where I pull my source and my help from. Um, but you just have to remember, um, once you get into this um, position, there's there, there's a transition that needs to happen. Your old self is no longer, you, you're, I was no longer Cassandra because now to everyone, I am councilwoman. You, you know, the ones who knew Cassandra couldn't see, some people still see Cassandra, but everyone now sees councilwoman Cassandra Timothy. So when I show up, I have to show up as councilwoman. Ooh, yes, to everything that they said, everything. Um, I wish I knew how much rage I would have to swallow in this role. Um, when you are doing it with genuine intentions, you are going to be infuriated a lot because of the powerlessness that Commissioner Monestine talked about and more power being outside of your, your hands than in it. Um, the changing of who you are uh, that Councilwoman Timothy spoke about. Um, the loss of anonymity that Councilwoman Harris talked about. Like all of those things, everything is happening all at once. And that is on top of learning this new role as an elected official. And like simple things like, you know, going to Target, looking however you want to look. You, you, you can't do that. I still do it sometimes and I just be like, I'm human. But uh, <laughs> you, you have to ground yourself in your humanity because when you get in this role, people think that you are no longer human. So I cry. I am passionate and they like to call black women angry. And I'd be like, whatever, I'm angry then. You, why aren't you angry? Um, but you have literally so much. Well, I do. Let me say me. I have rage all the time. And um, I know who my friends are, like my core group group of supporters and who that are family and friends. I know who they are and they get that really vulnerable part of me because it is hard to learn who you who to trust. But um, I'm going to adopt uh, Commissioner Monestine's um, saying you have permanent interest. That is very true. It is also one thing that I just did not anticipate. And I was a teacher, then I became a lawyer. And like with, with law, people are always coming to me with their problems. So like I could handle that and manage it. But in this role, someone wants something from you every single day. Every single time somebody speaks to you, it's like, you, you know something and ask is coming. And you know, it's part of the process or it's part of the role, but it is exhausting. And so um, sometimes I don't want to people. So when I don't want to go, when I don't have to be out of my house, I'm in my house with a glass of wine, sitting on the couch, watching Netflix um, so that I can regroup for the next day because it is, it is just a constant um, 
juggling of a range of emotions. Like several times in Tallahassee, I just, I lost it. Like I cried um, in private. And in some hearings, I was crying in the hearings. And it's like, I'm human. And I, I can still, you know, get y'all together very professionally and unprofessionally if I choose to, but I'm not going to be a, a robot. And, you know, I, 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 I wish I would have known, like, and you, you really can't describe it before you get in it, honestly. My, one of my consultants, she told me, she was like, this is going to be the most ghetto thing you ever do in your life. And I believed her, but baby, I wasn't ready for the depth of absolute uh, craziness that it is. Maya, absolutely. Maya Brown tell me that. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, Maya, every time I talk, Maya, you're right. You were right. Uh, but that is something that I wish I would have known. And so that's why I say, don't come into this position just for the title. Don't come into this position just for whatever clout or statue, stature you think is attached to it. This has to be a labor of love because it is truly a labor. Thank you for being so open about your experience. And yes. yes. I, I just wanted to say something to Representative Gaunt uh, in support. We're all outraged and enraged in our home watching some of the things happen in the state level. So your situation is a new level, new devil. And just keep your head up and know that we believe in you. <laughs> Thank you. So that uh, concludes the structured panel question portion of this panel. And we have about 10 minutes to move on to some questions submitted by the audience. Um, so the first question that I have here is, have you seen inequality or discrimination during your run for office and now being elected? And how do race and gender play into the kind of expectations, standards, and or support someone receives? Can I start that off? Please do. So, um, I experienced so much sexism and reverse ageism during my campaign. It was absurd. Um, the condescending, oh, hey, sweetie, or calling me like, oh, you're just a little girl. It was absolutely disrespectful. And one person even told me that I was too pretty. And then I had to stop being as pretty because some voters would not like me just because I'm pretty. And I was like, well, would you say that to a man? No, you wouldn't. Um, so the sexism is deep. It's in it right? We, we live in a patriarchy. And then in Tallahassee, it's a good old boys club. So we know Florida is in the South and our state is very racist. So you have to put that into perspective when you talk about the, the history of objectification of Black women um, and, you know, being attractive helps and it also hurts. And so if it helps for you to actually start listening to me, then I need to capture your attention in that like 60 seconds that I have, honestly. Uh, so navigating that space has been really, really wild. So it's a, it is a lot of um, sexism and misogyny. And then when we talk about ageism, like I don't understand the thought process of like not creating a succession plan and grooming the next generation. And I know this is a nonpartisan organization, but the Republicans have tried to like taint the word grooming, but you, you do mentor and you do, you know, teach younger generations how to lead. Like what I encountered and when I told people when I won, I said, I show you deference at the initial point. And when you are disrespectful to me, that's it. I'm not showing you deference anymore. And I'm only showing you deference because that's how I was raised. So if I'm knocking on the door, asking for you to let me in and teach me and guide me, and you're saying, no, you're too young, come back later because you don't want to give up the position. When I go through the window and I knock the, the window pane out and I get in the house on my own, you're not going to have any deference from me. 
Okay. And I'm going to bring in people. I'm not going to have the whole, you know, kiss in the ring process that you think I should go through because I'm sitting here fighting for my life and my community because of a lack of leadership or a gap in leadership from what I see in my perspective. So um, you have to be prepared for that because people come out there out of their mouth very crazy to you because you're running for office and they think you won't say something. And I am just not built like that. So, you know, I say something and I think that knowing how to have tact when you deliver it and set boundaries is very important because you still have to have professional relationships, but you also have to establish that people can't just treat you any kind of way and you accept it. So that has been a constant learning process for me because um, my friends very often have to talk me off the ledge. So it's a work in progress with me, but that's what I've learned um, throughout this process. And I've also learned to love myself a lot more to say, I won't accept this. And what does it look like for me not to accept it? And what does that look like when I have to verbalize that? So that I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Council member Harris, I saw that you came off mute. Oh, I did. Uh, I forgot the question. But um, <laughs> when I was running, I don't, I should say, well, racism is always present, always. Um, but I don't know if I experienced a lot of racism when I was running. It definitely was not direct, you know, directly to me. So I don't know. I was just running like I got your vote or I didn't, you know, I didn't really stop to mind anybody's uh, beliefs about me as a woman or as an African-American or Black. So I really don't know. But I do know as an elected official, oh uh, yeah, a lot of racism, a lot of, um, and, and I'm always managing myself and monitoring myself because you don't want to be too loud or too aggressive or too this or too that, you know, and I'm trying to just let that go and be me and they'll just, you know, and so it's really, really difficult. And especially when, especially in a small community, when things are not going the way that the residents believe, they really show their racist heads. They really do. We were recently trying to update our comp plan and we wanted to do some light light density in some areas and you get things like we don't want those people they're going to bring crime we only want million dollar homes in our neighborhood you know all of these are just you know what kind of words these are they're just modern day words for redlining and racism so I see it alive and well once I got elected when I was running I guess I, I just didn't have the energy to pay it any attention, but I do know it's always present. And sometimes I don't know if it's sexism, racism, or what it is. I really don't know, but I'm learning to just not give it any energy because it will suck you in. I went through six months of deep depression, anxiety. Every time it was time to go to a meeting, I would just literally be in tears almost to hold my head down. Even thinking about it right now gets me going. And now I'm at the point it just is what it is. I'm going to say what I want, how I want, when I want, and you just deal with it. I'm going to try to be respectful, but I'm not going to spend too much time concerned with, you know, how I'm presenting something versus just getting to the facts of the matter. So that's where I'm in. Um, for me, I'll be quick. Um, I did experience racism during my campaign. Um, I was called the N-word. I was, you know, there was slurs about, you know, you Haitians are going to just take over the city and make it like Haiti. Um, I was called the you peoples. Um, for me, I just, I just counter, I just counter it. So for me, I still went and knocked on those doors. I I had, there was not one yard, yard sign with my face on it in certain communities, but I still put out my message. I still said, this is who I am and this is why I'm serving. I also made a vow not to take any developer's check because I knew that development was at the core of what everybody was talking about in my district. And I knew that I would be a turnkey vote, but I just told them that, hey, I'm just, I'm just gonna make smart decisions. Like if it's good for the city and it's good for the community, that's what I'm gonna do. And that's just kind of what I stood by. And I also, what I kind of did to counter it too, because when I would walk sometimes alone or with other people, I would get the looks. So that's when I used to take my nephew and 
and went knocking on some of those doors. And at that point, you can't be, you know, you know, nasty in front of a child. So that's how I was able to kind of like still knock on those doors when I was walking with my nieces and my nephews. But. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be short. We live in a very racist world and most importantly, in a very ignorant world. So, and when I say ignorant, I, 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 I mean it literally because I remember perhaps 20 some years ago, there was an article in the in Miami Herald entitled the, or speaking about the educated illiterates, <laughs> all right? People that, that, that went to school, but are not really cultivated, are not really uh, uh, um, culturally sensitive, uh, uh, that are bigots, that are racist, that are that don't believe in what kind of society that they are evolving in, and and um, I think for those of us, and 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 honestly, when we realize the political experience of the last, uh, I would say six and a half years in particular, which has waken up, awakened most of us, uh, uh, of putting racism and bigotry, uh, you know, on the front page. Uh, uh, to our front doors, I would say, uh, I think uh, what, what I've heard people talking about right now, it's not whether it exists, whether it's not whether we experience it, is, is how some of us react to it, because it's going to keep on coming. The world is not going to be, is not going to become a better world. Um, people who, who are bullies, people who, are, who, who fear uh, how we, we, we um, use the, the power uh, handed to us by our community, they 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 they're gonna be uh, disappointed because because uh, unless they use it against a segment of a, pop of a population, unless they use it against certain other human beings, uh, minorities uh, uh, or minority groups, uh, and and there are many of them in our society, uh, they won't feel powerful. So we live in a very racist world, but most importantly, a world that is somewhat extremely materialistic and, and, and ignorant without, without, without being arrogant. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, so we have had a lot of questions come in from the audience. Um, and I was just told that we have a few more minutes to be able to cover some of them. So the way that this is gonna work is that I'm going to ask one of the panelists specifically to answer one of these questions. And I ask that the, the responses be about 30 seconds or so, uh, just uh, so that we have, uh, we, we stick to the time frame more or less. Um, so that said, um, the first question that I'm gonna pull here is for Councilwoman Timothy. Uh, you quoted Commissioner Monestim as saying that you don't have permanent friends, permanent enemies, you have permanent interests. So one of the questions was, how do you decide when and who to trust so that you can have support for your vision? Um, I think with that, for me, it's a bit different, right? I'm not, not like Representative Gant, who's in Tallahassee and have, trying to count her votes. But for me, I am one of five. And for anything that I need, I need three votes. Um, and so for me, we have to kind of find a common ground, right? We're sunshine, so we can't talk about things, you know, behind closed doors. So it's normally out in the open during council meetings. And, you know, everyone kind of like states their initiatives and know what they want to do. So for me, I let my initiatives be known. I'm working on them. If the elected officials want to support it, hey, they support it. And if not, don't come looking for me for my support. So the, hey, we're not always going to be friends because I, I think I fought with everyone on the council. <laughs> um, I'm kind of like the, you know, you know, the, the young outspoken one. But I also realized that there's some votes that are that I may not want to vote for, but I need to vote for it because I know I'm looking for support on something else. Um, I just think that it just has to be a level of, you know, just compromising. Um, you're not always going to get exactly what you want. Um, sometimes if I see that, hey, they're moving on an item, sometimes I'm like, hey, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go whether they, they need me or not. So for me, it's just a matter of stating my vision, making it clear, and staying on that path. Thank you. Um, this question is for Representative Gant. So during your campaign, um, how did that impact your personal and family life? What advice do you have to maintain a healthy balance? 
Um, honestly, there's no balance. There's a flow. I don't believe that there is ever a balance, right? So you might have to schedule literally on your calendar time for your family. Block out time on your calendar so nothing is booked and go spend it with your family, whether it's going out to breakfast, if it's just sitting, you know, watching a movie, you're going to have to schedule that. And you're also going to have to, you're going to have to keep your word to yourself and make sure you follow that schedule. Thank you. And this one is for Councilwoman Harris. Uh, how did you educate yourself in prepare, preparation for serving the community? Um, I, I basically, well, I was a member of the community, so I knew what were the concerns, you know, the high level ones, septic to sewer, uh, development of our downtown, you know, some of the high level things I was aware of. I read up on it. I studied it. I used people I knew, uh, you know, the, the feedback, you know, spoke to them about it. Then I went out there and listened to the community, you know, what they had to say about things and what was concerns of theirs. And, and that challenge was not great for this community because I'm sure it's a pretty great community. So I wasn't, you know, charged with fixing something, you know, we have challenges, but overall, it's a great community. So that's what I did. I listened to the people. And I, as a resident, I, a 20-year resident, I always knew what was our major concerns and challenges, which we still have today. Everybody's dealing with septic to sewer and development. You know, all the communities have that. So that's what I'll say. Thank you. And then finally, we have a question for Commissioner Monestin. What was the most unexpected source of support you received during your campaigns, aside from families and friends? Well, Andrew, allow me to discredit myself on the quote that uh, <laughs> Councilwoman Cassandra mentioned about no permanent enemies, no permanent friends, but permanent interests. It's an old political quote. I'm sure you are aware of that by, I think this, this you know, I don't even remember who said it, but, you know, in trying to quote that uh, old politicians, I, I shared these thoughts uh, to uh, council uh, with this uh, uh, with the councilwoman Cassandra, but it's not my own. It's not my own. Um, wow, uh, it's it's an interesting question. Uh, the uh, can you repeat it? Uh, rephrase the question again. Where I find uh, the most surprising? Uh, sure, the most unexpected source of support you received during your campaigns, aside from friends and family. Um. Wow. Um. I, I honestly, hello, 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 hello. Go ahead, Commissioner. Can. Yeah, okay. Uh, along from uh, along, uh, you know, beside friends and family members, uh, I would say, uh, surprisingly, it's 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 people whom you thought in the community as you knock on doors that would be uh, reactive uh, to your vision or you know respond to your vision negatively that that end up supporting you and agreeing with you and offer uh, you know uh, support um and and I and I would say uh well I think there is one that stand out um uh there is one that stand out there are many uh unions I would say that that as they negotiate their contract you, you try to uh, sometime, you know, find a middle ground because you want something to approve. Uh, I'm talking about when you're in office and 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 you're able to re reason with them, though they would be, you know, supporting their members 100% and see this is where we want to go. And, and you're trying to uh, uh, help negotiate on their behalf. And I would say that was a strong source of uh, support as I've done this over time as a county commissioner and uh, and the and the uh, and the other two campaigns since 2010, uh, uh, unions have become you know some of my strongest supports. Amazing. All right, um, that just about concludes our time for the panel. And um, so yeah, I really want to thank the panelists. You've been so incredibly generous with your time, your insights. You've been so open. You've had so much 
that I know that the audience and I myself have learned a tremendous amount from your own experience. So I really, really appreciate your time um, that you've given us today. And I also want to thank the audience for being so engaged and for being so polite and for writing so, so many incredible questions in the comments that I could pull from. So that was an amazing experience as well. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Destiny. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was phenomenal. You all have such amazing insights, such great experiences. I love the transparency, the truth, the real deal. So we we were honored and blessed to have you all here tonight. So thank you so much to Councilwoman Harris, Representative Gantz, Commissioner Monasteem, Councilwoman Timothy. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Um, if you all have any questions or, you know, I'm sure you can connect with their offices um, and connect with them in other ways. But we just want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time out with us tonight. And yeah, we're going to be taking a quick um, and thank you so much to Andrew. Yes, Miami Creation Myth is phenomenal. If you don't have it, go check it out. If you don't follow Instagram, go check it out. We'll drop some of those links um, in the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much um, for spending tonight with us. Thank you so much for the amazing moderation. Andrew it was fantastic. We're going to take a quick five minute break um, and we'll join back onto the Zoom at 736. Um, but yeah, go stretch, contemplate all of that juicy information. Um, go have a good scream cry <laughs> for all the rage that we have, um, you know, considering all of the things going on in our communities. But we're very, very thankful for you all. So we will be back in five minutes. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. And for everybody. All right, everybody, welcome back. Everybody can make their way back to their computers, their devices. Um, with just the few minutes we have left, since we're a little bit of a smaller group now, I'm actually not going to have us go into breakouts, but we're just going to do a, a quick discussion. Just want to hear from y'all. Um, what were your takeaways from that? I think there was a lot of important things discussed. There was a lot of transparency. You could tell from y'all's questions and engagement in the chat that probably was a lot that um, we were learning from our panelists. So just want to open up the floor a little bit and hear what, what were your big takeaways? What'd you learn? Can I speak? Yes, go ahead. I'm Broadway. I was with Dean Monastine when he first ran for office, first Haitian born county commissioner. And I learned how the game constantly keep on revolving because I thought I was going to be able to work with him. And they changed the boundary line. Then I got somebody else. Then they changed the bond. They changed again. I worked with Ashley Gant when she ran and became super person that she is and it's just like to me i listen to what she said and i say i want to run because i'm sick and tired of constantly getting sidebarred every time you get ready to do something for your community which i've been active this for the last 25 years in my community and to me listen to all they went through after they got in that position it make me somewhat pump my brakes you know what I'm saying? Because I understood what Gene Monastine said. You break up with friends, you create friends, but you just keep the same focus. Because I know everybody told me, why would you help out somebody that's Haitian? That's what the black people said. And I know he heard it on the same in his. How would you give him tickets to your uh, ceremony? He's African American. But at the end of the day, it's a lot that if anybody actually thinking about running, they really should replay this shit and think about it, hear it again, because this was phenomenal for me. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. to run and hearing all the stuff they go through after they don't won, I'm thinking once you won, it's over. Mm -hmm. It just begins. 
that's my two cents. I am Broadway from the Broadway Art District, and thank you all for what you guys are doing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Broadway. And I know you had a little trouble getting in on the Zoom. We did record it tonight, so we can send you what you missed. Um, we'll end up, we'll put it on our YouTube. Um, uh, Miss Baritha. Um, definitely, it was very, uh, it was good. The, the, you know, you, you, you always think of, you know, one side of it, and it was good to get the inside view. So thank you for that. Um, but the things that come to, um, what I got out of it, uh, to be quite frankly, is to be yourself. Don't go into it for the money. And um, definitely learn how to control anger management. <laughs> Something of a anger management. But um, most of all, know that you you are enough. Mm. You are enough. That's all I got. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I think I saw Jorge had a hand up, or maybe you were just reacting earlier with the claps. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I was just reacting, but um, I can definitely uh, share. Uh, no, this is this was uh, phenomenal. Um, I myself am uh, really considering doing a, a run in my uh, in my municipality as a, and the municipality level, and it just it was great to see uh, the range in terms of the different positions because uh, you have folks that or on the municipality, very, very local. The issues are definitely different. Um, it's all about, you know, how your taxes are maintaining the infrastructure, potholes, things of that nature. It's uh, it's nonpartisan, so you don't have to deal so much with some of those things. Although uh, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, it's become, even though it's nonpartisan, uh, it has become partisan. Um, it, it has become also very, uh, you know, on, on a municipal level, uh, has become very tribal. And so I was glad that some of the our speakers that um, were were invited uh, to talk today were able to kind of like describe that out um, and uh, in their candor uh, that you know at the end of the day uh, it, it's really tough to to go ahead and, and run for office now. I mean, I've never run for office, uh, but I've been involved in. Uh, politics in some fashion, way, or form, and um, and it's it's really um, it's a big decision, um, and so everybody has to be on 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 their toes um, and just know that it, it's just different. I I want to just make you know bring a, a brief little insight. I actually uh, have been speaking to some of the local uh, municipal council folks um, and just asking them again their experience in terms of them running. And the biggest thing, I, I encourage everybody uh, to go ahead and, and definitely do that because they can also tell you uh, how, you know, things are run. Everything is run differently, let's say, in Palmetto Bay versus Miami Shores versus Hialeah versus Sweetwater versus City of Miami. Uh, we're, yeah, we're in, we're in a big county, but we're just so different uh, from neighborhood to neighborhood. And um and the politics is different as well. And one of the biggest things that uh, these folks uh, that I, I've spoken to um, down here have said is that, look, uh, running is uh, running is just very, very tough. Uh, you have to be in a right place, I guess, in your life. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed um, uh, about uh, our, our rep Gant that she was, you know, she's she's young, you know, she's a millennial, she's us for the most part on, on this call and uh, she's had to deal with a lot of stuff and um and it's just it's just very hard versus the older folks you know they're in a different point in their lives you know their kids are out you know they have more focus uh you don't have to worry too much about you know taking your kid to kindergarten or whatever um so that's one of the biggest things that i, I appreciated on the call with everybody and the fact that you know it is hard but it's it's made harder now uh, because of social media, because of everybody just hides behind a screen. Um, and, um, and then once you get in front of them, you know, then they, they, you know, it could go either direction. So you have to be prepared for those things. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's very rewarding. So I'm, I'm glad and I'm, I'm excited. So thank you for, for, uh, hosting this. 
Yeah, thank you. I think they gave a lot of good reality checks, but also a lot of, you know, elements of what makes her warning too. Um, just going in order that I saw the hands. Let's get Morgan. Hey, Morgan. Hey. Um, one big takeaway for me or something I really appreciate is just the sense from everyone that like it is actually doable. Like you can run a campaign and not be bought off and not raise as much money as the other people. But if you know what you're standing for and actually putting the work in and have the right um you know support system around you that you can make it happen that was just uh very motivating because it often feels like there's way too much built up like energy or whatever it is pushing back against that to like feel that it is actually possible um yeah. so i really appreciated that and also just the awareness of like what it actually means for <laughs> for your life and like okay it'd be including more people in the thought process so, yeah, really really enjoyed it yeah and and especially what it's like to run as someone who isn't like the chosen one you know when people are telling you you this isn't the right time or you're not going to be able to do it you're not the right candidate and yeah exactly yeah thanks morgan uh wendy lucius uh, hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, I just um, want to say thank you. Uh, I've learned a lot. I experienced a lot, uh, especially with um, Calis Miami. I did experience going to Tallahassee. Um, I believe it was 2018, I believe so, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that was... Um, you know, very intriguing. Um, and just hearing the other, uh, each individual, like each council had a different experience and their advice, especially uh, telling us the, you know, the hard times they had to go through uh, with, uh, I guess, like the negative response and some positive. And to take that negative and use that to push you um, I don't know if that was Miss uh, Council Harris or Council Cassandra um, with saying about, uh, you know, she had to take a breather and not personally went out, <laughs> you know, that that challenged her. And um, I'm glad that she say that, you know, because I've been through um, the challenge and, um, you know, I want to build myself up to to go through um, some more challenges. It's kind of exciting experiencing um, some of the challenge. I amaze myself because I've uh, been vision impaired for about thirteen years. So I've worked. Uh, so I came from the world of sight, and then now I'm in the world of um, not seeing. So I I've gone through so many things. Um, so for her to uh, explain about, um, you know, the challenge you're going to go through with people challenging you, giving you attitudes and things that they say to you, um, I'm glad she said that, that I can prepare me uh, to be bigger and better than those individuals. Because um, people may not like you, people may not believe in what you believe in, but again, I... I want to help my community in every way. So, um, and that's, once you have an interest in the gold, I, I guess that will lead you. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Thank you for sharing your experience and definitely, um, you know, can tell that you're somebody who's so genuine in their desire to serve the community. I think that's true of so many of you on this call, of all of you um, and of, of our panelists. So um, it was great to hear that. Um, Carolina had a hand up, but I think it's down now. I don't know if you wanted to chime in or does anybody else uh, want to share what they took away from the panel? Um, I, I did have my hand up. <laughs> I took it down after Morgan spoke because he kind of reiterated everything that I was feeling. Um, it kind of created uh, more of a sense of uh, making running for office more tangible to the average person. Um, it kind of 
created this like humane experience in knowing that like these are regular regular people just like us y'all like <laughs> it, it you know they're very educated they have their masters and they're you know real up there but at the base of it all they're just people that really wanted to make a difference and saw a need um and that is all of us in this room as well so um i really did appreciate how you know catalyst has even created this forum for this to take place so thank you sure thank you um sunless martin see your hand yes uh well, first and foremost, just want to thank Catalyst again for just um, kind of creating this space and this environment for this. Um, most importantly, just our authentic, authentic. Uh, well, let me say it another way. Uh, just authentic on uh, how each and every one of the speakers was very authentic. It was just very candid and allowing you to understand. I mean, the goods, the bad, ugly, and different. And when you kind of sort of bought what it all boils down, it's it's doable at the end of the, you know, it's extremely doable. So I think yeah. that was very, very great takeaway. And again, it's not a right time. And again, it's the time is now, you know, even to the point where the councilwoman expressed that, hey, she didn't know if she was going to pay all her campaign people, you know, it's just taking that risk. And you still end up at the finish line at the end. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, you much, much appreciated their candor, for sure. Don't always get that. Um, just because they have to, as they talked about, like, put on a public face so much of the time to in order to, um, you know, serve. Anybody else want maybe one more final thought? I also yes, I see like if you have to, yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, after hearing everything, I would like to run from my district. I, it just don't make no sense for me to continue to stand on the sideline. There will be no changes on the sideline. Only changes when you bring the change to your community and you know your community needs it. So anybody okay. that's feeling like me, do not stand on the sideline. And whatever catalyst you all could do for me, I look forward to having your support and moving forward to bringing my community to its best position it could ever be in. All right, there you go, he's ready. Thank you, Broadway, that's awesome. That's that's what we're hoping for out of this, right? Is that some of us are gonna step up and get off the sidelines and and like Representative Gantt said, right? You know, eight years prior was the first time somebody asked her to run and it wasn't until she really got mad um, about the abortion ban and then said, who, who out here is going to challenge this man? And the answer was no one <laughs> except for her, if it wasn't, you know, if it wasn't for her. So uh, thank you so much. Um, and so that's the perfect segue uh, into uh, talking about how to apply for our Catalyst Candidate Institute. So Broadway, you should definitely be applying for that. Um, it's basically going to be a continuation of this. It's a five session series um, that's going to be starting on September 13th. Um, Wednesday nights, it's going to be in person. So that is um, a change. It's going to be in person at Neighborhood Housing Services of South Florida, which is in Little Havana. We have a space reserved there. We're going to have food. Um, and the purpose of this is to get, it's a more in-depth training. You're going to have different speakers every week um, who are either like people who've managed campaigns or maybe they've run for office before or served in elected office. So they really know their stuff. They're going to teach you about how to, you know, set up your campaign team how to build your own messaging and brand, how to um, do fundraising, grassroots fundraising. Um, they're gonna teach you all the things that you need to know. Oh, and of course, um, uh, organizing, grassroots outreach, you know, knocking doors, setting up your, your field plan. Um, they're gonna teach you all that stuff. So it's uh, the application, we're gonna drop it in the chat and it's, um, uh, it, it's linked on our website. So if you go to, I think Dustin's going to put it on the chat for me, but if you go to callousmiami.org slash CCI, Alice Cannon Institute, it's going to prompt you to fill in your information and then it's going to redirect to, um, to the application. So um, any questions about the, the application process is, is fairly straightforward. So you'll see it's going to ask you questions about like why you want to run and what some of the values are that motivate you. 
Um, if you're able to commit to all five sessions, you know, some, some basic questions like that. If you have ever run before or worked in a campaign before, um, it's going to ask you to name like community organizations you've been a part of, because we definitely do, of course, want to prioritize people who are demonstrating that they're already serving their community, right? We heard that from a lot of our panelists is like, you don't have to be in office to serve, you should be serving now, right? So those are some of the questions. And if you have any questions as you're filling it out, you can always contact one of us. Um, but any questions about, about CCI in general, and Destiny did just put it in the chat. Any questions? Okay, so then I hope it's super clear. I think these first two sessions are probably giving you like a pretty good look into what it's gonna be like. Um, Kwame says, appreciate the way they talk about training the younger generations ultimately run, exactly. So that's like, that's what this is, right? They're giving back of their time to talk to all of us and, and we have an age diversity on this call, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, whether you identify as being in the younger generations or not, it's not, to, it, now's the time uh, if you're, if you're ready to serve. So um, yes, Rose. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Um, that was incredible. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I, like many have already said, I echo all the sentiments. I appreciate their candor, their authenticity. I mean, you can really hear an authentic voice, which was really refreshing um from politicians so um that was just and so enjoyable i'm almost i'm almost speechless to be honest with you um but my question um that i had for you is is there for the cci is there a certain number of like candidates is it capped at a certain number of candidates um that can participate so we are going to we are going to have to cap it based on probably cost of just like being okay. in space, like space in okay. the venue and cost of food. But um, if we get to a point where we have to cap it, I'll be very happy because that will mean that we've gotten a lot of really good applications. So I don't, I'm not going to say a number where it has to stop. It just like we, you know, we can't, it's not unlimited amount of funding <laughs> to, okay. to support it. But, right. um, but yeah, right now, right now I'm going to say, go ahead and apply. And, and we'll go from there. If we get, if we get to a point where we have to cap it, I'll be happy because that means we got a lot of interest. Right. The, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. The reason why I ask is because I am, I'm, you know, I'm appointed um, to several advisory boards and I work now, um, you know, volunteering different boards and things like that. So I'm very involved in my community, but um, I don't know if I have like, I, I know in this, like my short term plans, I'm, I'm a doctoral student at the University of Miami. So I know probably right now I wouldn't run for something. I know that is very well in the foreseeable future. Um, I have been asked to run before um, and I said no because I had small children at the time. And so I'm, I'm, I have that itch now, like I feel that inkling, that stir in my in my spirit. Um, but I wouldn't want to take up space if I knew realistically that like, I'm not going to run, you know, like in the next six months. And that's why I'm asking, because I don't, I just don't want to take up space. If, you know, is there an expectation that we like people who participate and graduate are going to run within a certain time frame? Or is this open to just people that will run and that are interested, but they cannot commit to like, I don't know, a campaign in six months? Thank you for that question. Um, we're Put that information in your application. We're going to prioritize okay. people who are like, I'm running in 2024. But okay. I, I anticipate a lot of people will be in your situation where they're going to say, okay. I'm interested in running, but I'm not sure exactly when. I don't know if it's going to happen next year or in the next five years. I anticipate a lot of people will be in your situation. And so likely many, many people will be accepted in who, who are, have the same story, but we will, okay. of course, if, if you are someone now to everybody else in the call, if you are someone who's like, I'm running in 2024, um, put it on your application because that would definitely be a reason to try to prioritize. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you. Hello. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, I guess that was the same thing. Um, uh, 
what she said. I was asking, uh, like, did it matter when you wanted uh, to run? Because I want to grasp all the information and, you know, pull out some people that I know that are already in the community that I know and make a meeting with my family to, you know, their opinion and what they, you know, think, um, you know, not going by if they disagree or agree, but, you know, just the understanding, uh, um, wanting to know if I get the support um, that I need, um, you know, so should I just start a session or, you yeah, know, do apply. my research and grab, uh, okay. Yeah, if, you, okay. if you're someone who's already like, I'm gonna get my family together and like pitch them on the fact that I'm gonna run for office and see what they think, then you're already thinking well into this and you should definitely be applying. So yeah, I was brainstorming while the um, the councils <laughs> awesome. were talking and already knew who to grasp, you know, grab and support Perfect. me. So yeah. Perfect. Okay, I love that. Well, knowing that we're at eight o'clock, let me go ahead and um, no just reference the there's a session feedback link in the chat that Destiny put posted. Um, go ahead and click that as well and let us know your thoughts about tonight's session. That's really helpful. It'll help us improve this if we do it next time. Um, so go ahead and fill it out. She just dropped it in the chat again. And then we're going to drop the uh, application link one more time. Um, and we'll go ahead and release you all. Uh, if you have another question and you want to hang on, I'll hang out here for a minute and I can answer questions. But otherwise, um, thank you all so much and have a great night. Bye, everybody. <laughs>